communication centre. So the partnership and stakeholder relations to increase awareness, prevention and intervention strategies for suicide involving public transport. Scott Mills. Hello, Scott. Hello, how are you? He's a police officer with 23 years experience currently assigned to be a social media officer with the Toronto Police Service Corporate Communications. He has experience in community policing, schools, homicide squad, intelligence unit, street crime unit, gangs, and crime stoppers programs, and is leading law and is leading law enforcement initiatives in social media. And last, but by no means least, we have Anne-Marie Batten, who is a registered nurse with over 17 years in crisis intervention, forensic and mental health care and support, working with domestic violence, sexual assault, and mobile crisis intervention teams, both in the hospital and community settings. Anne-Marie has been embracing and leading through social media to assist those in crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. Good afternoon. It, uh, it's a ple uh, pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you for having us. I was listening to the hoarding uh, presentation. I don't know that I'm going to be able to do it quite as uh, adequately as uh, those presenters. That was really something to listen to. And I, I think that there's a direct link that most of you will be able to make to that presentation and the work that you do on a daily basis, at least as I understand. And I see a lot of heads nodding yes, that there was a direct link. And I was thinking to myself, how can I draw a link between what we're about to present to you and the work that you do on your uh, your day-to-day -day basis? And some of it may seem that it's a little obscure and maybe not directly uh, on point, but I think that as we go through it, you're going to see that you may have uh, what I had, and I call it an aha moment. And I was thinking uh, about some of the innovative work that our frontline transit safety officers at GoTransit have been doing with uh, representatives from the Toronto Police Service and the Mental Health Crisis Support Team. And it wasn't that long ago myself that I used to view suicides involving a, a GO train as something that was a service impact to our customers, uh, to the citizens in the surrounding area, and to the public to a certain extent at large. But I viewed it as a, an impact to people that needed to get somewhere, and not so much as somebody clearly, obviously, that was at the ends of being in the throes of a mental health crisis. Uh, and it's, uh, it's through the partnerships that we've been having with Scott and with Anne-Marie that I had my aha moment about three to four months ago where we've been doing a lot to keep people off of train tracks, and you're going to hear me talk about that, but we haven't been doing enough to deal with people who are about to commit suicide using a train. And uh, Scott Mills has a phrase that I've used at least five to ten times since I've heard him say it, and to the extent of this presentation today and how he and Emory are going to show you how social media is, is really a, a cutting-edge technology tool uh, to create a common hailing frequency uh, for us and for everybody to try and save some lives. Scott and Emory and people like them are not just working to improve lives, they're actually working to save lives. And through this presentation, they're going to give you some examples of how they've actually done that. So, a little bit of uh, shameless self-promotion about Go Transit. Some of you may know, uh, if uh, you were around, that Go Transit started in May 1923 as, uh, sorry, May 23rd, 1967, as an experiment on the Lakeshore Line. At that time, we were only moving 15,000 passengers a day. Uh, I think it's safe to say that probably everybody in the room is at least aware that we're nowhere near that anymore. We now uh, operate 12 uh, coach trains, multi-level coaches, seven lines throughout all of the greater Toronto, going from Hamilton to Barrie to Oshawa, Peterborough, and all points in between, Kitchener, Waterloo, and we're moving about 250,000 people a day on our trains. Some of the things that we've recently improved is we've uh, increased a 30-minute service on our Lakeshore lines. It used to be hourly service, or then a little bit more, but now we're down to 30-minute service. 96% of the ridership go in and out of Union Station. If anybody's been down at Union Station uh, recently, you'll notice that it's an area of significant construction. I can assure you that behind the hoarding, it's extraordinarily impressive. It really is. Uh, in April of next year, we're going to be launching our Up Express, which is the airport railing from Union Station up to uh, Pearson International Airport. It's going to operate about 140 trips a day, 15-minute service, uh, seven days a week, and we'll be moving about 2 million people a year. 
my uh, my area of responsibility that uh, I'm proud to uh, work with some tremendous professionals in our organization, and we've recently rebranded ourselves. Those that knew about Go Transit, we used to call ourselves Transit Enforcement Officer, or the Transit Enforcement Unit. We now refer to ourselves as the Transit Safety Office, and have for some time because our focus is safety enforcement is something that you do. Uh, so our Transit Safety Officers, a, a role that you may be aware that they did is. They're on board checking tickets on trains. They're making sure everybody's safe. They're ensuring the safety in parking lots. Customer service is a key focus. Uh, it's something that we really ring home to our staff. Uh, but it's uh, about sort of being a community-based officer approach. Some areas that you may not have known about transit safety officers is that those that are sworn in uh, have limited police officer authority and full peace officer authority on the property. They have the authority under the Criminal Code, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, Youth Criminal Justice Act, various provincial statutes like the Trespass to Property Act, the Liquor License Act, I've bold the Mental Health Act, they do have authority to make apprehensions for somebody that they feel is uh, at risk and meets the criteria working uh, in partnership with the Police of Jurisdiction and the Safe Streets Act. We have a very, very large uh, area, service area to cover uh, and to do so we have 80 plus sworn special constables and 15 plus uh, provincial offences officers and nine dispatchers and then a bunch of people uh, like me, two of us, uh, that uh, sit back and get out of the way of our professional staff who know how to do the job and make our life easy. So this is a satellite view, and I don't know how well that's going to come up in the back of the room, but it's a Google representation of our service area. And I've gone a little bit through, uh, as I warned you, some shameless promotion of Go Transit and what we're about, but what does any of this have to do with mental health crisis and suicides? Hopefully the back of the room can see the representation. Each of those pin dots is a suicide that's occurred within the last four years. Just the last four years. Unfortunately, we average about 10 suicides a year. And that's just GO Transit. That's not the VIA trains, that's not the CN trains, that's not the CP trains, that's just GO Transit trains. The impact to us uh, is enormous as an organization. Um, and like I said in the beginning, we used to focus on the service recovery piece. We used to be concerned about getting that train moving as quickly as possible. I'm sure there's some folks in the room that may work for municipalities where the population may be 50,000, greater or less. Uh, the equivalency of a suicide on a GO train is like shutting the town down. Nobody can move. None of the trains before or after can move. Uh, it uh, creates quite a ripple effect and, a, and a, a significant impact. And for the last three or four years, we've been making great strides in improving that experience for our customers working with the coroner's office and local police. But we, we missed the obvious piece, prevention in the first instance. We got good at creating the statistics and making nice graphs that showed how we were doing, how our service recovery was doing. But we, see, we, need, we had an aha moment to look past the statistics and realize that these are people and that we need to engage the professionals and come up with some creative and innovative solutions to actually try and prevent this from happening in the first place. Traditionally, we've been very good at prevention of trespassing. Uh, Operation Lifesaver is a term that some of you may have uh, uh, heard in the past. If you have any children in the GTA, either we've been at your school or we will be within the next four years. It's uh, using age-based appropriate material to speak to elementary school and high school students about the dangers about being near train tracks. Uh, we send officers into the school and they give a presentation, usually three per day, and we've made a commitment to hit uh, all of the schools in our service area in the next four years. We've always been committed to public safety, uh, and we take the safety and security of our customers uh, si seriously, but we needed to address the gap of suicide prevention in the first instance. So while our service recovery improved dramatically, we took what used to be a three to five hour delay on our GO trains down to on average 60 to 90 minutes now. Uh, our educational awareness of the impact with police departments and the coroner's office dramatically improved. The suicide rates did not. So we weren't ad addressing the root cause. Uh, so a staff initiative that was completely unrelated to suicide prevention, some of our staff became young men and women came to us and wanted to be on Twitter and uh, we were reluctant to give them the green light to do so for all the reasons that an employer might have some concern about their staff being on Twitter. A relationship formed with Scott Mills from the Toronto Police Service and some of our staff about how to get on Twitter in a way that is appropriate and safe. 
And through that relationship, uh, we started to form the, the partnership between Scott Mills, our organization, and Real Time Crisis, and realized that there was an innovative uh, role, a, a very prevalent and present role for social media to play in social in uh, suicide prevention. And almost immediately upon that relationship being struck, the suicide rate improved. And even if it's only by one, it's a dramatic improvement. I'm going to turn it over to Anne Marie to talk about the next steps. Hi, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here and to talk to you about real time crisis. Um, you'll see as you go through the slide, it, it's innovative and we're very excited. We really are the only professionals doing this kind of work. So it's, it's okay to be the first person, but it's a little scary at the same time. So I'm just going to give you some statistics. Hope the back can see. If you can't, I'll just read them out. So there was a study done in 2012 that shows that the leading cause of death by injury is actually suicide. We know that suicides have increased in the last 10 years by at least 15%. And when we talk about communication these days, social media has actually become the most prevalent form of communication that's currently being used. When you think of Twitter specifically, there's 400 million tweets a day going out there. 500 million registered accounts on Twitter, and even if someone's not using it every day, there's still 288 million active monthly Twitter users. And when you think of the prevalence of smartphones, and I'm sure everyone in the room has one, 25% of smartphone users between the ages of 18 to 44 say they cannot recall the last time their smartphone was not right beside them. This is a tweet that we see, sitting on the tracks, waiting for the next train. Good luck. I'm going to come back to that, but I want you just to think, if you were just on social media or your kid was on social media and you saw that, what would you do? Sorry the picture isn't so great, but so what is real-time crisis? This is a picture that was actually used in Toronto Star. <clears throat> excuse me, in an article about us. We are a not-for-profit corporation. I, I can introduce a few people to you. Obviously, Scott Mills is here today, and I'm sitting beside him at five foot nothing. Um, to Scott's right is JC Lamb. She's a leader in the education world. Behind her is Josh Riven, who's a transit safety officer. We also have members with lived experience that we brought on board to shape our decision making as we decided to build this program. We have community members, youth leaders, leaders in law. We basically brought one of every discipline that we could think of to a table to start to figure out exactly what we could do about a broken system. That was how the dialogue started. So we have built a structure. We're a not-for-profit. We're seeking charitable status. BLG Law has been helping us to get there. We want to have trained mental health professionals who will be responding to mental health emergencies. And we're beginning our operations here in Toronto. But as you'll see as we go through, there really is a need because, as I say, there's no catchment out there in the virtual world. So our vision is wordy, but I'll break it down. We, we know that there are many positive ways to use social media, and unfortunately, there's negative ways as well. When we think of positive, of course, it's saving and improving lives. Negative can be cyberbullying and everything you hear on the news these days. Sometimes you hear a lot more about the bad than the good. And our mission is to connect real-time professionals in real-time interventions. So as I explained, our purpose is to have trained professionals who will be using social media tools. We use Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram currently. We also have a YouTube account, and we also have a Google Plus page for anyone that's on the page. Our accounts are up, and we're communicating on them, but we're not actually doing real crisis work on them. At this point, Scott and I are actually doing the work on our own accounts just because we're not operational yet. But we're promoting a success and safe outcome by engaging with people and building relationships. And that's, I know those are words, but it's something that's really important to think about. 
because when you're working in mental health, just as in the previous um, presentation, if you don't develop a trusted relationship with a person you're working with, you'll never get to the truth and you'll never get the disclosures that you need to really make a difference. And our group is excelling, we're bridging the gaps between community, social service, community mental health. It's a fractured system and we found that using social media is actually building bridges between all involved. So back to our back to our tweet, sitting on the tracks waiting for the next train, goodbye world. <laughs> this is Ricardo. He's a young man who is a volunteer with our program, and this is an example of what happens. So sometimes someone will see a tweet like that out there. There's two things that they'll do. First of all, they may retweet it. And if they have a lot of followers, that means that thousands of people are now seeing what that person sees. They may pick up the phone and dial 911 and call local law enforcement. But in this case, we're providing an option. They've contacted Real Time Crisis and said, I've just seen this account. Is there anything that you can do? And, and this, does, this does happen. So because I'm a nurse, I decided to, to try to reach out on my own about a couple of years ago. And this is basically, I just started saying, this is who I, you know, I'm a nurse, can I help? Sometimes I'll say, can you follow me back? Meaning that they have to follow me and I can follow them so that we can direct a message for privacy. Because you really don't want this out in an open forum. You can't exchange dialogue like that. So we, we do our best to get them off of the main area and into private messaging. If someone is on the train tracks, we can locate the person with the use of geotagging, and that's why it's important to have partnerships with Go Transit Safety Officers and with law enforcement because they can help us locate. If I'm online with someone though, I can actually find out the location. And as Scott will speak to coming up, having someone engaged in real time with someone sitting on the tracks can save a lot of time taken to locate that person. We can contact Go Transit through the TTC or safety officers who are on Twitter and make arrangements for them to hold the next train coming into that area once we find out the location. And even if I can't do anything else, the primary goal would be to get that person to step back from the tracks and bring them to safety. And sometimes that's the first thing you say. It's You may not be able to really save the person but you may be able to bring them to safety for now. And that's that's a key factor. So at least continue this conversation, but step back from the tracks while we talk. And this is actually a Twitter account. This is a, a real Twitter account. And this is the kind of stuff that we see. What happens a lot is young girls who could be self-harmers, they could be hoarding, like in the previous, a lot of anxiety, depression out there. These accounts, all talk to each other and they all get support from each other. So a lot of these girls that have self-harming behaviors are throwing tweets out saying that they're going to cut themselves and harm themselves. This account, this is what this account did. If you'll notice, that person has 4,600 followers. So when she tweeted that she wanted to die, 4,600 people saw that. She then, you can't see it in the, in the picture, but she cut her leg and posted a bathtub full of blood and, and said goodbye world. And then this is what people saw. And if you notice on that, there's 115 retweets. So she's got 4,600 followers and that just got retweeted 115 times, could be all over the world. And this, this is actually a true story. So this, message continued to get retweeted and retweeted and retweeted. Ricardo, who was our volunteer, got involved. He started doing some research on it. What he found out was someone had actually contacted him and said that they had heard a discussion at a dinner table because this had gone on for days. And a teen's mother said, we've heard about this account on Twitter. This, we think that this girl died. It was actually coming to the dinner table for teens about this tragedy. So Ricardo actually was realizing that these pictures were very disturbing and he decided to contact Twitter to see if they would take them down. 
So even as a volunteer from Real Time Crisis, Twitter answered him back and said, if you're encountering personal difficulties or just need someone to talk to, it, it may help to talk to a professional. So you can see from that that Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they do not have anything in place to reach out to people. So we have spoken to Twitter and we're really hoping to make a connection with them because we can also save Twitter a lot of time and work in locating folks as well. So the National Suicide Prevention Line is who Twitter refers to and that's who we're referring to right now until we become fully operational. But without having a partnership between different community members and law enforcement, we, we can't do this properly. It, it's all about the partnership. So I think it was five to seven days went by and it turned out this girl was okay. She was in the hospital. So she had been found and she had been taken to hospital, but for that time period, no one actually knew if she was okay or not. That it can have a lasting effect on, on teens too. This can be really damaging. So how do, how do we do what we do? If you think of the MCIT program in Toronto right now, it's a police officer and a nurse that go to calls. They go to calls when there's already something in place and it's a reactive process. We try to be proactive. We're basically a social media based MCIT. So if you think of having a nurse and an officer working online trying to get ahead of the event, then that's really what we're doing. We promote a listen more, talk less approach, and we use our ears to listen. Our ears mean engage, assess, respond, and safety. So we engage with the person directly at risk in a non judgmental way. I'm a nurse, can I help? Ask an open ended question. I really have never had anyone say no. And we do an assessment. The purpose of having a mental health professional is actually to do a comprehensive assessment to determine the level of risk, to see what kind of community partners we need to bring in. We then build a response that's appropriate to that level of risk. And most important is keeping safety for the person at risk and all the service providers involved. Okay, I'm gonna call on Scott to come up and explain from the law side. Hey, thanks very much, uh, Steve, and thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, I'm a Toronto police officer. Uh, I've been a police officer for 24 years. I uh, spent the first 12 years of my policing career right here, so it was like coming home today when I was driving into the Novotel uh, here in Mississauga, and it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you about this. Uh, so I just want to give you a little bit of background from law enforcement perspective uh, about where we're at. Um, uh, my team at Toronto Police Corporate Communications uh, have seen some great value in what Amory is trying to lead uh, simply because having a nurse going out and saying, can I help, instead of going out in front of, we have over 80,000 followers on our Toronto Police Twitter account, which I'm responsible for. Uh, if I go out and say, can I help as a police officer, A, I'm a police officer, so it's a little bit... Uh, potentially a lot more intimidating than a nurse, and uh, B, it's in front of, in a public space, over 80,000 people. And uh, on, if it's on Facebook, it's in front of an endless number of people, and we want to bring it into a private space. So we're not officially partnered with Anne-Marie uh, right now, uh, but it's thanks to the uh, leadership and vision of people like Steve Weir who are willing to stand in front of you and put a slide up and say that there's a hundred suicides just by go trains in four years um, and we need to do something about it and this is an option uh, that we need to look at uh, I think is extremely positive towards partnerships going forward. So my, my end goal as a police officer standing in front of you here today is to A, make you aware of what's going on, which uh, Amory and Steve have done an admiral job of, and B, to lend my personal support behind this as a, as a social media officer. Um, I've been using social media since 2004. Uh, I started using social media as a police officer uh, because we had 12-year-olds that were intimidating an entire uh, school population in the Western downtown schools on social media platforms that probably many people in the room here have never heard of. And that was back in 2004 and it was out of control then. And uh, um, essentially the, uh, the teachers, 
uh, weren't allowed to go on by policy on social media. So it was uh, a free for all out there for the kids. Uh, most of their parents didn't understand how it worked. So again, it was a free for all for the kids and the cops didn't know how it worked. So we started figuring out that how it worked because we were seeing 12 year olds threatening to stab and actually stabbing other 12 year olds on the streets of Toronto. And they were tasked to myself and, and my, my team at that time to investigate. So I essentially took a personal stand that's an, enough is enough. Um, I ended up in 311 Jarvis Youth Court over 90 times in a one year period arresting uh, young people for this type of stuff. And I said, we need to make a change. And that was back in, in 2004. I've really focused on prevention since. Um, I ended up getting to, to work in the Toronto Crime Stoppers program as a, as a youth officer. And uh, we had one quarter of the staff in Toronto Crime Stoppers at that point. And uh, we actually tripled the number of tips in a two year period from 300 a month to 1,000 a month anonymous tips with one quarter of the staff engaging the message. And why? Because we were using relationships like Amory has stressed, relationships are key, and using a social media strategy. So essentially, what does that mean? It means celebrate what you're doing and have the people that are listening to what you're saying, uh, listen to it and share it and your influence will grow. And uh, it, it's, quite honor, it's quite an honor to hear Steve say the whole thing at the introduction about common hailing frequency because uh, Twitter in, in particular, but all of social media really is a common hailing frequency to be able to do that. And we're, we're slowly getting to the point where we can do it in real time to actually help people. So the man that I heard say that was Jeff Pulver, uh, who's the co-founder of Vonage, and he's actually the man behind the Pulver order in the United States, which deregulated voice over internet protocol and allows things like Skype to operate and uh, Google Plus Hangouts on Air, which we're doing right now, we're live streaming right to YouTube this entire presentation. So the, the, the whole idea is we're going to tell you at the end where you can find that. Nobody's watching it right now live because we didn't really engage it. But if you buy into what's happening here and you want to try and figure out how can we do this, you can actually go see our presentation slides on the realtimecrisis.org website as well as this entire presentation so that you can share it with people that you know that can make a difference if, if you're uh, so inclined to do so. So we'd really appreciate if you did that. But that's just a little background of, of, of where I'm at. Uh, two months before the G20, I came to uh, Toronto. I think we all probably remember that. Um, I was uh, taken out of the Toronto Crime Stoppers program and put into the Toronto Police Corporate Communications Office and tasked with uh, starting up Toronto Police Social Media officially. So ever since then, uh, with the help of a lot of people and a huge team, um, Sergeant Tim Burroughs in particular uh, really helped me uh, and helped us to get where we're at. Um, a lady named Laurie Stevens, who's on the board of directors for Real Time Crisis, uh, helped us out quite a lot uh, as a uh, consultant to come through our organization and actually see how we can use social media. So I'm really proud today to stand before you and tell you that we've got over 300 Toronto Police Service civilians and police officers that actively tweet, that use Facebook and any other social media platform that they can uh, put a, a plan for that they've got purpose and process to use to get the potential and payoff. And uh, how, how it works is I can actually do something from my phones. I've got a Blackberry and a Samsung Galaxy here with me and I have an iPhone too if I could afford one. But uh, the, uh, um, essentially, we can do a, a tweet or an Instagram post or a Google Plus post or anything right from the phone. It'll go right out to all our social media sites. and It'll go right to the Toronto Police website. And that's really, really effective for emergency management because within about 30 seconds of us tweeting something on the official Toronto Police Twitter account, that's where news kind of breaks these days. It's being reread all over uh, on uh, traditional media outlets and we're able to actually let people know officially what's going on. So transfer that into what is, how can real-time crisis really help? As you've seen the tweets here, if somebody's, uh, we get a lot of uh, incidents where people are tweeting directly at our police officers or our civilian members. Um, 
especially those who engage with people experiencing mental illness like myself, we'll get a lot of them, and they'll say they're in crisis, and we'll try and dial them down onto a uh, platform that's private and try and get them not to be in crisis. So where it fits in with GoTrain is we were able to actually train some of the transit safety officers that are physically riding the train to use Twitter and use it for success every day. So promote the success of Go Transit. And they, we found that we've got a huge connection with the Go Transit safety officers as the Toronto Police Service people that are using the platforms to connect when there's not an emergency. And then when there is an emergency, we're working very closely together to inform the public about what's going on especially, uh, and, and, and keep it going. What you don't hear is all of these suicides. So this takes tremendous leadership on the part of Go Transit and Steve Weir to throw that slide up while we're live streaming out to YouTube and put the slides up and say, look, we're trying to reduce suicides and we see social media as a way to actually do that. How could we do that? Is essentially we need to invest some 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 staff and some policy into it and some partnerships. Um, but I think Amory's pretty much said how it works. The ideal would be that if I re if I sat down after this presentation, picked up my phone on Toronto Police, and somebody had at Toronto Police, I'm sitting in front of the tracks right now. I could just reach out on a back end system or on a front end and say, hi nurse, on the back end, I've got this one from Toronto Police Account saying they're going to kill somebody, kill themselves on the tracks, and at the same time have the Go Transit people on there to stop the trains, get the nurse to actually engage with them, so it's a nurse can I help, not a cop, and uh, actually get, have the dialogue with the nurse to bring them off the tracks and have the Go Transit people stopping the trains, and next thing you know, we've saved a life, and the people riding the train aren't late getting home, so it's great for business, right? And and it needs to be said because because you know anything is a business, but these people, the hundred people in four years killed by go trains, those are humans. And when that information comes in on the back end to us, you as the public don't hear it. You hear that there is a pedestrian fatality. You hear that there's a trespasser and the train's late. And you can kind of guess as to maybe why, but you don't know the gory details. We do. We do. We want it to stop, and we really, really need your help to do so. And um, it, a lot of people would say, why are you talking about all this type of stuff? It's because we truly do want to make a difference. And we truly need everybody's help. And um, I think we can all probably either say that we've heard that something was said out on Facebook or Twitter or something like that. And then all of a sudden somebody committed suicide. They cried for help, but no... Either the people that saw the cry for help, that's why it's relationship based on, on their, this whole strategy is relationship based. The people that saw the cry for help most likely didn't know what to do, right? Most likely had some very close friend or family connections to the person and didn't want to get involved for one reason or another. It, it's just reality. Um, and what's, what's happening is the cries for help are going unheard. So with a good strategy in place, um, we can actually be, pre be prepared that when somebody calls into 911 and says, I just saw this person on my Facebook say that they're going to go jump in front of the trains, we can institute the front end to go and try and talk to them right away, institute the, or start up the back end where we're trying to actually trace physically where they are and get the train stopped. And then the whole goal of what Emory wants to do is once we have those people in our care, to fill the gaps in the system that don't let them get into crisis going forward so that we don't have a recurrence. So the reality of all this is that both Emory and I um, are getting a lot of messages. We're on text messages a lot. 
Uh, we're, we're using a thing called an app called Zula app to have team communications in the back end. But again, it's all informal, and we'd like to make this bigger. And ironically, Jeff Pulver is the man who uh, started up this team communication Zula app. So he's watching very closely what we're doing, um, and uh, we'd really like to make it bigger and better. Yes. And I want to say that I don't think we should um, have suicides hidden anymore, and it should be should be out there. But what I wanted to ask is, where are you getting the funding to make sure you're able to do all that? And are the municipalities in the provinces going to then turn around and say, well, we can't help you out because of our budget? Um, bottom line is, uh, Anne Marie is probably best positioned to answer that question, but I'll answer it for you. We have no funding. Anne Marie has no funding. She's got a board of directors. That includes uh, Scott Abrams, who has a healthcare background. He's in Wisconsin. He's the former chairman of Crime Stoppers USA. He's very passionate about this. He's had personal experience in his family with it. He's the chairman. Lori Stevens runs a company called Laws Communications, who was the Toronto Police Consultant to get our social media strategy going. She's a board member. Um, we have a probation officer for the, from the province of Ontario who's volunteering his time. Ryan Mason is his name to be on the board. And we have Anne Marie, and and, my, and that's it. And we have myself, who's a police officer who believes. And thankfully, I've got uh, uh, an excellent team behind me at Toronto Police Corporate Co Communications, led by my immediate supervisor, whose name is Megan Gray. Uh, I'm Toronto Police Service Corporate Communications Issues Manager, and our Director of Communications, Mark Pugash, is, is uh, very supportive of all this, and basically says it's the right thing to do. Um, how we're going to get the funding going forward, and uh, I don't know, but uh, all I can tell you is that there's a brand new website that just went out there today that we worked hard to get going for today's presentation, so you can go and connect with it, and if you know some people that can make a difference, uh, we seriously think we can save lives. We're always learning something new and different um, on social media. I just learned something very relevant the other day on how to actual, actually geocode uh, using Google Maps uh, use on Tweet on TweetDeck, and I'm a Toronto police police officer that's been doing social media full time for a long time, and I didn't quite know how to do that. And it was a community member who showed me how to do it, Joey Coleman out of Hamilton. And I'm going to sit for hours with him until I can figure out how to do this because that's a service that you could use that's actually free. You just need the knowledge and the human resources involved with it to actually do that. And there's many other uh, platforms out there that are being looked at. Uh, but the bottom line is it's not going to happen unless we have money. Um, Where do you look for it then? I don't know. So maybe you guys can help. And Marie can probably talk to that. Um, what I'd like to do, because I think we've got our key messaging off, is we, I've got about three more slides here that I actually want to go through. And I want to, there, there needs to be value in you people paying a big price to be sitting in this room. So and not be able to watch it on YouTube and there's some things that are of a private nature that I wouldn't want to share in a public forum. So if you don't mind, I'm going to turn my YouTube video off and I'm going to go through a few other slides here that I think are probably going to really sell you on this uh, because uh, there's some pictures that are going to come up that uh, uh, it, it could be any one of your sons or daughters. And uh, I We've got, if you go on the same YouTube account where this is actually being broadcast to watch, you'll also, if you want to watch uh, Amanda Todd's mother, um, we've connected with her through Jesse, um, uh, Jesse Miller from Mediated Reality out of Vancouver, uh, who's helped us extensively with, with this uh, project, and he's connected us with Carol Todd, and we've actually broadcast Carol. Uh, when she was here at the uh, Canadian Safe Schools uh, Network Symposium, so you can go and watch what she has to say. And uh, the day, uh, two days after she found out that uh, an, a man alleged to uh, have uh, harassed her own daughter um, that, that committed suicide after posting a YouTube video um, saying that this was going on. So two days after she found out uh, that uh, an alleged uh, suspect had been arrested in the Netherlands, so this this isn't just about here, it's, it's very global. It's very hard to get funding for something that's very global. Um, so two days after, Carol actually joined me via one of these Hangouts on Air on Google Plus uh, at a, something at a symposium down in Vermont, and you can actually watch that in its entirety. 
So you can watch Carol talk before she finds out about that there's been an arrest made and after and see the pain on a mother's face. And I'd like to think that if any of our kids put a YouTube video up that's now viral with millions of hits saying, I'm being harassed, I'm going to kill myself, that somebody somewhere would see it and do something and save their life. And with that, we'll do some private uh, stuff here.